Hey, uh, lots to get to on the show today, but first we want to welcome in our uh, 8 a.m. guests. That includes uh, Clint Hogbin. Clint, good morning to you. Welcome back. Good morning. Thank you for inviting me here. Um, and just for the record, my wife chooses my clothes. <laughs> <laughs> the safe approach. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, and also Darren Grindel. Darren, who dresses you in the morning? I do. Good job. <laughs> it's good to see that somebody has evolved to independence when it comes to clothes selection. And I might add, we sniffed him when he walked in. He didn't smell like a hamper. <laughs> Well, compared to John, <laughs> <laughs> we're making progress around Sniffing here. Sniffing the guests, though, it's always that awkward moment when they come it is. in, you know. But <laughs> it is a condition of uh, appointment, so people know when they come in for an appointment, they will get, they won't actually. All right. Uh, hey, let's uh, let's talk in Sorga. Uh, obviously, there's some changes that are coming to in Sorga, ha or have already. Right. Clint, can right. you update us? Well, let's let's start with a little bit of history there, so folks know, reminder, what in Sorga is. It's a it's a building, a 60,000 square foot facility that was built several years ago on solid waste authority land uh, there on Grapevine Road. And the purpose of the facility was to take everyday waste, everyday household waste, and to process it through equipment so the, they could make a fuel. They made a solid, uh, what they called SRF, solid re recovered fuel. And the fuel was sold to the Argos facility on the south end of Martinsburg. Um, about 18 months ago uh, in Sorga sort of shocked us, those of us who follow it, by announcing a temporary closure uh, that they thought would be a month or so. And then that turned into um, all of a sudden all the employees were gone and the, they essentially abandoned the, the facility and, and left it with uh, waste inside of it. Uh, as time went on, um, uh, the waste that was in it began to draw rodents and began to draw uh, heat and compost and uh, smoke and then ultimately even fire a couple times. Uh, so it was a real mess, uh, to, put it, to put it simply. Um, and the um, Solid Waste Authority uh, had no legal obligations to, to deal with the facility, but of course we had all the moral obligations. It was on our land and we were there to protect the public interest. and. We asked uh, Apple Valley if, uh, under the guidance of state agencies, if they could jump in and help us out and, uh, and do some re remediation uh, of the facility. That was finished last year, uh, and we've been basically dotting I's and crossing T's in uh, the pre-existing lease agreement between the Solid Waste Authority and Ensorga. In the interim, um, basically, you know, following the legal steps, to evict them from the property uh, and to essentially, um, we've reached a point where we own the buildings. Uh, the Solid Waste Authority owns the buildings and we are, um, from a legal perspective, fully able to utilize and, and take steps to restore the operation. Uh, and so uh, the board, my board uh, decided that it would like to do that in two steps. One um, we called short term and uh, the second step, which is yet to start, called long-term. And uh, the idea with the short-term uh, lease or a short-term arrangement, we issued RFPs and took proposals from waste companies to utilize the facility for the management of waste. And uh, there were certain criteria. Uh, Apple Valley was the only company that um, submitted a bid uh, on that proposal. We have a lot of interest at in the long-term proposal. We have probably maybe 10 companies that are looking at the long-term, but Apple Valley was interested um, in a short-term proposal. They made a, uh, which the board did accept. And uh, we are in, the, I'm gonna call it the final stages of a sort of a technical cleanup of our lease, or of a contract between the Solid Waste Authority and Apple Valley to, uh, to utilize that facility uh, in the management of waste. Clint, would you uh, explain what you, what you mean by long-term and short-term, what constitutes the The short-term lease is, uh, was a month, is a month-by-month -month, uh, But I'm lease. talking about for what utilization, or did you define the utilization? Well, in the RFP, we didn't. We let we it up didn't. to the private side to decide uh, to offer ideas. Long-term hasn't been written, but the, the concept of the long-term RFP will be landfill diversion, will be to, to make fuel again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, or some other similar technology, you know, to landfill diversion. And as, of course, as the eastern panhandle grows, we create more waste. There is a natural reluctance to increase landfilling. So we have to come up with um, 
alternatives and uh, as we urbanize and and, and we see that as uh, uh, a growing area in the waste industry that could we could take advantage of. Uh, Clint and Sargo was built with Argos in mind as the as the recipient of the fuel. Uh, would there have to be some retooling of what's in the building if you went to a broader spectrum of users? It depends on the company. Yeah. They they as they tour and look at the operation and have conversations with us. Some will say, "Oh, we don't like this equipment. We would totally bring our own in." Others will say, we'll keep this and remove that. Um, and Sorga is one of the, themselves, believe it or not, is one of the 10 companies interested, of course, th in that situation. If, uh, if we were to go with a proposal from them, that equipment might stay. But some of the equipment was damaged in the fires, mm -hmm. two cranes, and there would have to be um, substantial repairs made. How many potential users do we have within, say, 50 miles, 100 miles of of Martinsburg. Well, the two that I'm aware of is is Argos, yeah. and over in the Hagerstown area is another facility that uh, is geared up to util to, to blend um, SRF with with coal to to be used for fuel. Uh, I'm told generally that in uh, a 200 mile radius of the uh, of our area that uh, there is a, an incredible market for that kind of uh, opportunity. Is if I I'm so one but quick question. Is it feasible for, I assume we have to truck everything. Uh, is 200 miles within the trucking realm a feasibility, economic feasibility? It would probably require a, a, a different management technique than what Insorga was using. Okay. Since they were only going, uh, you know, a mile down the road, it was, it was not bailed, yes. you know, it was mm -hmm. not uh, compacted in any way. So that would probably change if we have to go much farther than Hagerstown. I'm sorry, John. If I remember correctly, the reason the, the, that this whole process started was that Argos stopped using the fuel, right? It, well, uh, I think the reasons or the, the issues are, are maybe there are different perspectives and views of what happened there. I'll offer that. My personal view is there was a business arrangement between Argos and Insorga that fell apart. Um, I, I don't know if that was all the problems, but that is clear. And... Um, you know, and, uh, and I'll say this, one of the companies that toured um, a couple weeks ago brought Argos with them, brought a representative from Argos with them. So Argos is interested in the fuel, at least at that level, uh, but something fell apart, and I do not know what that is. If I did, I'd tell you. Mm -hmm. Something fell apart between a business arrangement between those two companies. So the long-term side of this is essentially getting back into that fuel for energy, or uh, uh, waste energy Yep. Process is at that right? some level or another for sure. And the short term, then with Apple Valley, is is what? Yeah, I'll let Darren speak to that. I I think we'll we'll you'll hear a new term here, transloading. So um, we'll we'll let we'll let Darren talk about that. Hey, just a quick note. Uh, this just flashed the uh, three thousand block of Grade Road just east of Nestle Quarry Road is shut down due to a traffic accident. Darren. Um. Thank you. So a wonderful summary, Clint. And and. Oh, the, the definition of the business challenges between Argus and Insorga are many. Some of them are design issues and some of them are execution issues. Um, the beauty is, is that in the short term, we don't need to address any of those things. Um, the reason that this worked so well from a design perspective conceptually was that this was going to be a reliable place for the community, for Apple Valley, to take the residential waste, uh, which creates tremendous efficiencies. Um, and we're going to get all of those efficiencies again by being able to bring our waste there and transload it, simply put it on larger trucks to reduce the time and cost associating with the transfer to a landfill. Um, so that offset in additional efficiencies allows us to take on all the, ex the costs associated with actually managing that process. So we're currently still maintaining the security of the place and making sure they don't have any environmental issues or compliance issues under the existing permit. But being able to bring our trash in there and transload it will allow us to pay rent um, and have it be an even Stephen wash. Is there a permitting difference with that method of uh, transferring waste, Clint? Yeah, you, um, it is. I mean, um, uh, another similar concept of transloading would be called a transfer station. Both words are defined in DEP statute as to what they mean. And transloading, re it requires lower permitting requirements than, than a transfer station. So this is not a transfer station uh, activity that the um, 
that Apple Valley will be doing. It's, it's they're simply taking their own waste, where a transfer station would take other waste from mm-hmm. other entities. They're simply taking their own waste and transferring it. Now, your landfill, carrying the landfill, is that the local landfill, Darren, or you take it in, into Maryland as well? Um, so it'll, that remains to be seen exactly. It depends a little bit on the contracting. When you're only doing month to month, you really can't sign long-term deals. So it'll be it's economically driven in terms of what the best place to put the trash is. What's the um, general makeup of the trash from that facility that you're hauling out? Oh, it'll be the same as what's going in. Uh, we, we won't be processing anything in the normal facility. This is just an open space on Berkeley County land in order to put it into larger trucks to reduce the overall costs associated with getting it into the landfill. Is it going to be going into the big pits that are inside the building? No, it will not. So it's just on the ground? It will, No, so the entire building is set up to maintain a leachate um, containment. And mm-hmm. so it's by its nature and its design, it's perfectly within compliance of whatever you would need if you were opening a transfer station along those lines. Yeah, so the waste will be going in the building, but not into the pits. Okay, so and in a perfect world, assuming 100% efficiency, if the, when a when a load of trash, the, the gum wrappers and whatever arrive on on Monday, are they gone by Tuesday or they, yes. is it? Okay. Absolutely. It's designed to do a daily thing, a daily basis for it. It is possible, however, given the nature of the facility, that it, the trash is allowed to stay overnight. So yes, it, because of the containment and all the other things that went into the design of this, it's one of the unique benefits of that facility. But it's a quick turnaround. It one hundred percent. Where is this being done now? Um, it's not. We're taking all of our trash directly to landfill. And in fact, one of the biggest challenges, if you try to take anything in Jefferson County, ever since Insorga's been down, the lines there are huge. You could spend 45 minutes over there. I did with my guys, and I was talking to the consumers out there and apologizing about what was going on, but hopefully telling them that there would be some near-term relief here as we were able to go back to the design that contemplated bringing trash to the Insorga site. Now, you mentioned Jefferson County. That's, that's a transfer station, is it not? Yes, it is. Okay, but that's not the final depository like we have with a landfill. That's correct. Okay. Now, Clint, I gather you're fairly optimistic that the building will eventually be able to go back to its original purpose. Yeah, um, I'm an optimistic person at heart, and I and you have to be to to, to do what what I do, and um, um, and I and I think and deep in my heart that we can get there. It's going to take time. It's going to take work. Uh, there's going to be a few nights where I'm not going to sleep, but um, it's important to the community and our growth that we uh, stand this up, and, and we'll get there. Are you getting? I know you're getting a lot of uh, uh, support and encouragement from the county. What about the state? Is the state involved at all? Yeah, actually, I don't know that they're involved. I guess the DEP has some oversight um, on you know uh, Darren's activities there at the site, but. Uh, you know, I've had um, multiple emails and conversations with Scott Mandarola, who's number two at the DEP, and he wants to see this operation mm-hmm. restored. Um, you know, this was a, from a solid waste perspective, this was a feather in West Virginia's cap, and we want to get back to that. Now, and Sarga was planning to build a second plant similar to this one. Did they complete that, or is that so they had status? they had um, a facility in New York that they were um, uh, considering and um, th- its permits were denied by the state of New York by the way and for what reason do you have any I idea? don't I don't know the specifics of it um, and uh, and then they were also considering a facility in the Morgantown area in Mon County and that just uh, as far as I can tell that just never took off before they mm-hmm. they stopped operations here but the uh, there are several ways to recycle or to convert from waste to fuel, uh, and this was one of, of uh, various. Is this fairly well accepted in the community and the recycling of uh, the conversion community as a profitable economical way to go? Well, we, well, I'll answer that this way. When we went through the original permitting of the facility um, and, you know, the Solid Waste Authority's concerns really weren't about the company's economics. Our concerns were about you know, the impact on the community. And so, you know, we, we held public hearings and we were required to. And so we held public hearings and the vast majority of those that spoke supported the idea of using our waste for something better than just putting it in a Sorry. landfill. So, yeah, I mean, I, um, I, I mean, I think there's a little black mark on Ensorga right now with the situation, but we can erase that and turn that into a positive, but it, it'll take time and work. Glenn Hogman and Darren Grindell, our guests here on the program. Uh, Darren, we asked you this last time that you were on the program, and I think the answer was less than 10 years, but what is the lifespan of the landfill right now in terms of capacity? 
time wise? The so the landfill, the, the landfill is okay. privately owned. It's not owned by Apple Valley Waste. It's owned by Waste Management. So okay. Darren wouldn't necessarily know that, but they do um, <clears throat> are required to report to the state every year their capacity, the remaining capacity. And I look at those reports. Um, they don't report them to the county. I have to get them from the state. And when I last re- looked, I, I mean, don't hold me to this exactly, but it's in the neighborhood of 25 or 26 years. 25 is this much further out than <clears throat> I thought it was then. Well, it'll come here fast. Yeah. Well, Which, how, how many tons of waste get dumped into the landfill every year? Uh, well, they're permitted to accept up to 500 tons a day, 9,999 tons a month, which is the exact permit um, requirements that were on in Sorga and are on the Jefferson County Transfer Station. Now, Clint, in the ideal world, will reduce the amount of going into the landfill. Uh, but if we do not achieve the ideal world, are, uh, will the landfill, does waste management have the option of purchasing adjacent land, or is they, are they pretty much land blocked? I don't know. Okay. Can't, can't answer that. What is, the, in, in the industry, what is the future of waste going into a landfill? Obviously, you can't do this forever because you'll run out of space. Yeah, my sense of things is landfilling will be around a long time. Uh, they, however, there is, starting back in the 1990s, there was a, a clear path um, <clears throat> in the industry to um, reduce dependency on landfilling and, you know, recycling. Uh, nationally, it uh, reflects about 30% of our waste stream. Um, Landfilling is about <clears throat> 55, 60% of the of the management of our. And I think in time, you'll see those numbers continue to evolve, where alternative to landfilling uh, will become more and more uh, commonplace. It already is in other parts of the world, Europe in particular. Uh, there are there are hundreds of resource recovery facilities in in Europe. And last I checked which has been a few years ago, <clears throat> the European Union actually had a ban on new landfills. Uh, so, uh, and, and there will be a time where you, landfills just get more and more difficult to site. They're already difficult, but become more and more difficult to site in urbanized areas, and you're going to see alternatives uh, step up. One, one more question here, John. So, uh, in regards to recycling, is this myth or is, is, is this uh, reality here? Uh, I've been told by so many people, one, first and foremost, the recycling market is much more difficult now than it was previously. Secondly, a lot of the things that we think we are recycling, and I've heard the figure be quoted as high as 90% of the things we think are getting recycled are actually ultimately getting dumped into a landfill. Is that true? Well, it doesn't happen in Berkeley County. I, I, I can attest to that. Now, uh, well, your first question about the economics of recycling, it is much more difficult to recycle today economically than it was when we started in the 1990s. I'll give this example. Uh, we take large volumes of cardboard and mixed paper. Uh, mixed paper, the revenue from that used to fund itself, all of the cost of collecting paper, plus uh, create about $15,000 a year of revenue for us. It now costs us about twenty-five dollars to $30,000 a year to recycle that paper. It has the economics. Some of it's driven by the loss of uh, ox paper board over in Halltown. Some of it's driven by the loss of Southern Scrap down in Winchester. Um, and um, some of it's just driven by the national economy. So, you know, yes, economically recycling is more difficult, at least in this region, uh, in this area, than, than it was a, lo- a long time ago. But I do not see large-scale uh, landfilling of recyclables. I'm sure it happens um, places I've read articles in credible magazines in the waste industry magazines where it happened but as a general rule I don't think I think that's more myth than reality John waste and recyclables are regulated differently so during the process of what was happening at Ensorga and what sounds like will be happening when in the, in the long-term side basically the waste energy conversion does that change the regulatory status of residential trash that's dumped there does that change regulatory status from waste to recyclables so um the waste going into uh, the, the 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 management of waste at Ensorga was treated as mixed waste resource recovery and was permitted it that way that permit is in place and remains intact today there was uh, not a lot of again a legal word here not a lot of recycling in that building it was resource recovery, another definition. Okay, so 
uh, that will, that permit is valid, and that activity will be uh, the Apple Valley permit. The active Apple Valley activity will be a com, uh, will be under that permit and a compliance order that they uh, are helping with uh, since the all the issues began about a year but ago. But the beauty of it, as I understand it, is you take a, a waste material, which by definition has no further use to it, and then you turn it into a marketable commodity right. on right. on on mm -hmm. the back end. Right. How efficient is that process when it's working well? Do we once I don't understand the, the conversion. I'm going to guess is proprietary to some of it is proprietary technology, but it is essentially John um, uh, separating material with equipment, uh, drying it, removing moisture BTU content, and then shredding it, and then removing low BTU items from it, uh, so that you've got a, a, a high BTU. Um, uh, product that is nearly the same BTU value as coal. Clint, this is fascinating, but you had a couple of other points you said you want to discuss today. Yeah, we, we've got, uh, I'd like to get the help get the word out here. We've got a special event coming up Saturday. It's at the South Berkeley Recycling Center. It's our bulky good collection event. So this is uh, Saturday, September the 30th, again, at our Inwood Center only from 9 to 5. We're taking items like mattresses, furniture, washers, dryers, refrigerators, hot water heaters, televisions, computer monitors. There's a limit of four per vehicle. Obviously, this is an effort to keep those items from showing up along the side of the road. Uh, no general trash will be accepted, no construction waste. Uh, but um, we will be, that's a very popular free event that we will be hosting. In addition to that, next Saturday, the October the 7th, at Grapevine Road, 9 to 5 again, the pesticide collection event. We'll be working with the Department of Agriculture. There's no limit on quality. If you have any pesticide, uh, things like insecticides, herbicides, rodenticides, fungicides, and any other item that ends in CIDE, we will accept those items for free thanks to the help from the Department of Agriculture. And so I uh, hope to see some folks there. Bring all your sides. Bring all your sides. <laughs> Trash in two sides. Trash in two sides, yep. <laughs> Gives a different meaning to the menu, doesn't yes, it, it does. Uh, Clint, we have another couple of minutes or so. Uh, you do uh, pickups every year. You, you did the screen pickup earlier yep. in the year. Uh, I don't think you've actually had the opportunity to report out the success of that. You're the only group doing this, if memory serves. As far as I know, we're the only solid waste authority doing active stream yeah. cleanups in the state of West Virginia. I mean, there are um, stream cleanup. There are stream cleanup activities by watershed groups that you know volunteers and such that are going on. So every Saturday, me and a, and a couple paid staff goes out into the Peckin or Back Creek. Or Sleepy Creek Lake, and we pull trash and we pull tires, and uh, we've been doing it since 2018. I brought some numbers. Um, in the five-year period, 11,030 tires have been pulled out of our creeks, 1,297 bags of trash, 1,147 bulky items um, have been pulled out of, of just the those creeks. It's it's a it's a program that I thoroughly enjoy doing. Um, maybe that's the outdoorsiness in me coming out. But I, I and and I've had uh, fortunately I'm getting feedback from those that canoe and kayak that they are seeing a difference uh, as they uh, are recreate on those streams. And so I'm, I'm very very pleased to be able to do that. I remember doing that as a kid. Uh, growing up in uh, in Pittsburgh, they had a program where, I don't know if you've ever heard of Kennywood Park, but it's a legendary park in uh, Pittsburgh Amusement Park. And if you if you did a project cleaning up a stream or, a, a, you know, something like that, you got free tickets to the amusement park for the day. Mm -hmm. And I went down there, I think, with about six or eight of my friends and pulled out a bunch of old bicycles and whatever. Might not be a bad community project, huh? Well, we actually uh, have funding, uh, you know, that uh, stormwater fee that we all hate, that we all have to pay. It Part of that money comes to the Solid Waste Authority, and we fund uh, the employment of two high school students that go with me. And they, so it's a great way for them to earn some cash um, and build their resume and uh, and help an old man clean some streams. Yeah. <laughs> you, you mentioned Bill, I didn't know you were down there cleaning streams. <laughs> I have done, I've worked with Clint a couple of times for it, but it's a it's a pretty arduous task that day. You it's work a lot hard, of work. A lot of work. Uh, but we, we in Berkeley County are blessed with some wonderful streams that are really underutilized. Opekin, for example, is as good a canoeing stream as you can find anywhere, but it's a but 
folks don't know about it. Folks are not on it that much. Clint, any final things you need to get across? I don't think so. Uh, just again, a reminder, this Saturday, those bulky good cleanup event. Um, last Saturday, we did one and had 230 items come in, and I'd love to top it this coming Saturday. Great. Darren, anything? Nope, we're great. Excellent. Good to see you both.